Major Tim Peake will be the first British astronaut to go to the International Space Station. He will also be the first British citizen who, does, who didn't have dual citizenship and also who never had a contract to go into space. Now, he's currently undergoing rigorous astronaut training in Germany, and this is going to be a kind of Q&A session, so if you do have any questions you would like to ask, ask an astronaut, this is the good time to kind of start to think them up. So when I come round the room, when I go to your table, you're prepped. Now, ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce to you, live all the way from the European Training Facility in Cologne, Major Tim Peake. Hi, Tim. Hi, Mike. Uh, and good evening, for, everybody. Thanks very much for uh, joining us tonight. Now, Thank you. I, I just hope the miracle of Skype can keep going for the next 20 or 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is a Q&A session, so I'll kick it off. Now, you went from a major in the Air Corps to being selected out of 8,000 candidates to be in, in the astronaut training program that you're in now. So do you want to guide us through that and tell us a bit more? Yes, I was actually working for Augusta Westlands as a helicopter test pilot. I'd left the Army after a really fantastic 18 years flying. And um, I saw an online advert, Astronauts Wanted, from the European Space Agency. So along with about 8,000 or 10,000 other people, I applied. And there started a, a year-long rigorous selection process. Um, it was really quite a, an interesting um, an interesting thing to go through. The psychological profiling was right from the word go, and it lasted throughout the entire year-long process, and it really um, formed a basis of that whole selection procedure. But on top of that, we had um, sort of hard skills, if you like, um, such as concentration tests, spatial awareness, memory retention, um, and then onto soft skills such as communication and team building, um, all that kind of stuff. So the space agency really sort of put us through our paces for that whole year. And of course, we had a week long medical as, uh, as you have to do to pass, pass the quite rigorous um, standards that they expect. And thankfully, I, I went through to the final interview round and was selected. Cheers, cheers, cheers. Uh, my uh, question is, my question. oh, there's a lot of delay in this. Uh, my question is, uh, do you think that your army career made you made to be sort of successful within your application with the ESA and to be an astronaut? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think without a doubt, my army career played a huge part. Um, I think astronauts really, or the European Space Agency in particular, were looking at a number of different things. With some astronauts, they're looking at a very scientific other astronauts operational experience. And that's two of the kind of routes that you can become an astronaut. And my background was clear, clearly very firmly in the operational experience. I left school at 19 with three A-levels in maths, physics, and chemistry. And I went straight to Sandhurst because I knew I wanted to fly. I was desperate to be a pilot, and I knew that took a long time. So I thought the sooner I get onto the flying training, the better. Um, I ended up doing my degree in flight dynamics at the grand old age of 33. So um, you can see my background was very much operational. I had about over 3,000 hours flown over 30 different types of aircraft. And um, some of the operational areas that I'd worked in, that's what appealed to the European Space Agency, along with the um, educational qualifications. So without that Army background and without that operational background, I don't think I'd have been selected. But um, like I say, that's just one route into becoming an astronaut. Some people are selected straight out of academia, um, scientists, geologists, etc., and straight into the astronaut course. So it really does vary. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, given that a lot of the purpose of the International Space Station is scientific discovery, what is your mission brief in terms of that scientific discovery? You say you're very operational, but what is your role when you're on board the space station? Yeah, I kind of joke and say the role of an astronaut, if you can follow an IKEA instruction and build a wardrobe, then you're good enough to go. Um, we, uh, it's, it's not quite that simple, but we actually become experts on the laboratory and we become experts at implementing the experiments and managing them, running them and shutting them down. But clearly we're supported by thousands of scientists on the ground who have designed the experiment and they're the experts in what's going on. Um, so for example, just this week in Germany, I'm, I'm here at the European Astronaut Center in Cologne and I've been learning about the fluid science laboratory, about the biological 
biological laboratory. Um, and these are just payloads which are already on board the space station and they can accept a number of different experiments. We need to know exactly what's going on with the payload. We don't need to know exactly what's going on with the science. However, of course, it's in our interest to know as much as possible because the more we know about it, you know, we're interested in the work we're doing. We also need to be able to pass the message on to people who ask you know, great questions about what is the science you're doing. So we, the more we know about the science, then the better. Tim, I, I just wonder, just, you've been through an intense training program and you continue going through it. Going What's your most no notable no, no, high point I, to date and your today. greatest shortfall? Yeah. <laughs> there are probably too many high points to choose, but um, right up there at the, uh, you know, up, the, up in the top of the list would be the NEMO mission that I went on about two years ago. And NEMO stands for NASA's Extreme Environments Mission Operation. And they were simulating a mission to an asteroid, which is very much on the program for the early 2020s with NASA. They're looking at doing an asteroid capture and moving that into a lunar orbit. And there were many questions that they need to answer in terms of how do you actually work with an asteroid? How do you capture it? And then once you've captured it, how do you um, get scientific samples? What sort of tools and techniques and procedures do you need? So we spent 12 days living underwater in uh, an Aquarius habitat, a habitat called Aquarius off the coast of Florida. And in those 12 days, we were diving morning and night, and we were trying to answer all of these questions. So uh, as a keen diver myself, it was absolutely wonderful experience, but also from an operational point of view, working as if it was a, a, a space mission with NASA, with a ground control, it was really the high point of my training. Uh, the second part of your question, what's the shortfall? Um, well, I think for, for any astronaut, you know, the short stick, if you like, is the amount of travel. On the one hand, it's great to be able to visit other cultures and to be able to meet so many people, but it really does play havoc with personal life. So travel is a definite uh, short point, but also um, learning Russian language has been a struggle. Uh, I, thankfully, I'm at the stage now where I can kind of laugh about it and enjoy my lessons and converse. But uh, for the first four years, it was really hard work. Uh, following on uh, from the last one, you said that uh, travel was something that was a downfall. Obviously, you're traveling quite a long way away. Um, how, long um, I, how long are you going to be away for, and what do you think you'll miss most about the Earth? Uh. <laughs> yes, yeah, so the mission, itself is, uh, the mission itself is six months long, which uh, isn't really that long. I mean, again, coming from a military background, I'm very used to doing six months uh, tours away from home. And... I've got lots of friends who are still in uh, in the army and in the air force, for example. So six months is not that long, but I think up in space you get that extra sense of isolation away from friends and family. Uh, and without a doubt, it's going to be friends and family that you know I'll, I'll miss the most. But. Also, I think uh, I'm, I really love the outdoors. I mean, uh, all my life I've enjoyed uh, camping and hiking. And even now with two small children, I get them outdoors as much as possible. And I think I'm going to miss that kind of outdoors experience, the fresh air, whether it's mountain climbing or kayaking or sailing or whatever. So I think when the hatch opens on the steps of Kazakhstan after six months away, that first sort of breath of fresh air, feel relief. Hi. Hi. I know Hi. you're going through quite a lot of physical training, but what are you putting yourself through mentally training-wise to get yourself ready for being away? Yeah, well, I'm thankfully the the space agencies have kind of thought about that and they've put us through the, the the grill quite often in terms of the mental preparation. Things like the living underwater for 12 days, um, you know, that really does help you get help you focus your mind into what you're about to do and working as a team in a, in a small closed environment but also I've spent seven days living in a cave again with a group of international astronauts in Sardinia and we ran that again along the lines of a space mission and a cave is a wonderful place if ever you want to try and stress somebody because all you need to do is take their watch away and you have no idea whether it's day or night so you can get sent to bed and woken up two hours later and somebody tells you you've just had a great 10 hours sleep or eight hours sleep. You carry on with a working day wondering why you're so tired. And then uh, they do the same again three nights in a row. And by the time you've had that done to you a few nights, you, you're not sure whether you've been down this cave for five nights or eight nights or 10 nights and when you're getting, getting out of it. 
And so it's quite interesting to see when you have these kind of stresses and you can also obviously play around with food and people, some people get stressed when they have a lack of food, lack of sleep, um, lack of routine. Um, and those kind of things help you to understand a lot about yourself a lot about other people and how to work with other people, even in stressful situations. Um, now, that's just one example, but there, there are a number of ways you can prepare people for this uh, unique sort of experience of living for six months in space. Obviously, space Obviously, is a very um, extreme environment. Extreme. Is there anything you're looking forward you're looking to about forward being in low being gravity, in anything you want to try or try. something, something, you, something you, you want to do while you're in there that you couldn't do on do the planet? Um, I'm going to take up some uh, bungee cords with me because there's a few experiments. I'm not going to give the game away, but there's a few experiments I want to do um, myself, using myself as a, some bungee cords. Um, but I think most of the astronauts just say living in, working in weightlessness is, is a unique experience. And it's quite funny because when you first get on board, you're joining people who have already been there for at least three months. Um, I'm actually going to join two astronauts who are, are doing a year-long stay on the space station um, for the last four months of their mission. So these experienced guys, they can spot the rookie astronauts straight away. It's a bit like learning to ski. Um, initially, your legs are flailing, arms are flailing, you're kicking things off the walls and knocking things all over the place. After about two weeks, you really get the hang of it. And after about a month, you're doing the black moguls and no problem at all. Um, so I think just trying to master weightlessness in itself is going to be a fun experience, something that's good to do. With like third world poverty still oh. rife across the globe, uh, the globe, why do you feel high capital investment in space travel is justified? I missed the first part of the question. I got the, the second part. Um, what was the first part? Sorry. With like uh, third world poverty still rife across the globe, why do you feel investment in space travel is still justified? Yeah, good, good question. And you're absolutely right that the question gets asked. We need to justify what we're doing. We're using taxpayers' money in order to go into space. Uh, the reality of the situation is that the money that's spent on human spaceflight is actually incredibly small. Um, and that's so it should be. I mean, for as, as an example, um, Germany is the largest contributor in Europe to human spaceflight by far. And each taxpayer pays about seven euros per year into human spaceflight. So it's a very small amount of money in terms of uh, when, when you look at it from a global perspective and what we're doing. What is important is that we invest in the future. We invest in not only humanity's future, but also technology, engineering, and science. All of the things we're doing on the space station, it's money that's spent on Earth. It's not spent in space. Companies are building those parts, and people are involved in those, in those experiments. So from an industrial level, it's jobs um, and it's employment. And on a sort of technological level as well, we're demanding things of industry that nobody else is demanding in terms of the actual extreme environment that we're working in. So there are a number of different benefits, both back on Earth and also for the future of humanity. I'm a firm believer that at some point we have to leave the planet. Now, hopefully that's not for a few years to come, but we're at a position now where we need to start developing the technologies that will enable us to do that in 100, in 200, maybe 500 years time. So it's actually quite a modest amount of money and I consider it as an insurance policy. I think it's something that we can't afford not to spend money on. Hi, Tim. Hi, Tim. Just Hi a there. question about the um, you'll obviously being a low gravity environment. How much does that affect the, the diet that you'll be having? You know, in terms of the, your exertion level. Yeah, the diet's interesting because it's the diet's affected by what you can carry up there and what you can keep for a two and a half year shelf life, which are some of the constraints. And obviously, the food has to be prepared. So it's either irradiated, or it's uh, tin food, or it's uh, freeze dried, for example, rehydrated, that kind of stuff. Um, so trying to get the correct amount of nutrients in the food is not too difficult. And trying to get the calorific value of the food, again, is not too difficult. What is difficult is trying to make it tasty. You guys are, look like you're about to sit down and enjoy a really nice meal, which I'm very envious of. Um, and I know that uh, my colleagues on board the space station tonight, they'll be very envious of that as well, because uh, the space food generally lacks taste. Uh, it lacks a bit of taste. It lacks a lot of texture. 
um, and it lacks salt because you can't afford to have too much salt in your diet. Otherwise, that makes the um, bone density loss a, a bigger problem. Um, so, yeah, the food is probably not going to be a highlight, but you may or may not go, know that I've got some help from a number of school kids who've de designed some meals for me. And I've managed to convince Heston Blumenthal to actually cook these meals and get them flown up to the space station. So at least I'm guaranteed one or two nice meals during my six months. How soon do you think it will be possible to travel like in Star Wars? <laughs> I'd like I'd love to stay in my lifetime wouldn't that be great um, uh, we've got some big technical technological hurdles to overcome uh, you know the, the speed of light is a real challenge no one knows if we'll ever be able to break it. Um, it we need to if we're going to master intergalactic travel but just looking within our solar system we're focusing on Mars at the moment and Mars is still a seven month journey there one way And in that seven months, we're going to have a high dose of radiation. Um, and we're going to have to come into the Martian atmosphere at high speed and find some way of decelerating and landing on the planet and then getting out and working prior to coming back for seven months. So uh, we're a long way away from Star Wars right now. But I do certainly hope that in my lifetime, I think uh, we will see somebody land on Mars, not just land and plant a fat flag, but land to work on Mars and start to build a permanent habitat. Um, that may well start on the moon. I think we'll probably in the 2020s, we'll see a lunar habitat go up. And then I think in the late 2030s, early 2040s is when we'll see that, that first Martian mission. Um, Star Wars, uh, let's give it another couple of hundred years, I think. So thank you very much for spending your, your time with us this evening, answering all of our questions. And just thanks very much again. It's a pleasure. And thank you, guys. And, um, And uh, we wish you all the best for your space mission in 2015, which has recently been named as Principia. Did I pronounce it right? That's absolutely perfect. I don't really mind how you pronounce it, but I am told it's Principia. Right. Well, thanks very much, Tim. Thanks again. Cheers. Thank you very much. Enjoy your evening. Thank you.